everyone and welcome back to the Bundesliga show with your hosts, myself, Rory Petrie and Mark Broadhurst in Nuremberg. Welcome back uh, to another match day week, week uh, 19 of the Bundesliga as we go into the second half of the season. Um, we've got a very special treat for this, uh, for this show this weekend. We've got a returning guest, our first ever returning guest in the form of uh, Josh from JJD TV. So we're very, very pumped to get him on and talk Bundesliga and talk Dortmund uh, in this show. So uh, so moving on, um, we're going to go over to Mark for the anagram in one second. Uh, but just before you do, uh, if you are watching and you watch us fairly regularly and you haven't subscribed yet, please do click that red button and get yourself subscribed and then you can watch all our shows all the time. You don't miss out on anything. So without further ado, over to Mark for Mark's Mystery Anagram. Okay, yes. Yeah, so let's start by recapping last week's uh, Mark's Mystery Anagram. So yeah, I'm just going to stick it on the bottom of the screen. So as you can see, it was catchier shirt sin. So, yeah, we did actually have a couple of people on our live stream when we went live on Monday night. We had a couple of people who commented the correct answer. So good job, uh, Ian and Johnny, two of our regular fans. I think they also follow Josh over on JJD TV as well. So, yeah, we got a kind of a bit of a cross uh, channel <laughs> fan base there as well. And the correct answer was indeed Stuttgart's uh, excellent longstanding coach, Christian Streich. So, yeah, obviously, usually we say that um, whenever it's, we have the anagram, then it gives a good luck charm to the team. But obviously, this week it wasn't to be with a, not such a good result for the Freiburgers. So let's uh, turn over to this week's um, Mark's Mystery Anagram, which is, as you can see on the bottom of your screen now, it's two words and it's inhaler birth. So, yeah, if you're listening on our uh, podcast, just take a pen and I'm going to read it to you slowly now. So the first word is inhaler, which is I-N-H-A-L-E-R. The second word is birth, which is B-E-R-T-H. So remember, it has to be something related to the top division of the Bundesliga. It can either be a club, it can either be a manager slash coach like it was last week, or it can be a player. Anything related to the top tier of the first Bundesliga. So, so yeah, so that's your Mark's Mystery Anagram for week 19. So let's have a look uh, very swiftly at the results from this week. So as you can see on the bottom of your screen. It was quite an uh, incident-packed week, as usual, in the Bundesliga. So, yeah, starting on Friday night, we had a 2-0 win for Stuttgart over Mainz. Moving on to the Saturday afternoon games, Bayern 4, Hoffenheim 1, Josh's Dortmund 3, Augsburg 1. Yeah, a good win for them. Frankfurt getting a 3-1 win at home to Hertha Berlin. Union Berlin getting a one all draw with Borussia Mönchengladbach. Um, and then Werder Bremen getting a one all draw with beleaguered Schalke. And then moving on to the evening kickoff on Saturday, RB Leipzig got a big 1-0 win over the Battle of the Top Four sides over Leverkusen. Then on, on moving on to Sunday, we had big wins for Cologne, who won 3-1 in the relegation six-pointer against Armenia Bielefeld. And then we had a brilliant 3-0 win for Wolfsburg over Freiburg to close off week 19. So over back over to Rory to introduce our guest for this week. Yeah, and it's a very popular guest that we've had on before, someone who has a very successful and growing YouTube channel, a uh, very quickly growing YouTube channel, I must say, as well, in the form of Josh uh, from JJD TV. He's very kindly agreed to come back on the show and uh, sportingly I decided to show the colours as well of his favoured team, Borussia Dortmund. So we're all we're all sporting our colours today, which is great. So uh, also, if you don't follow Josh on Twitter, just go a search for JJD TV as well and give him a follow as well. Um, but without further ado, let's get him in. Hello, Josh. Hello, Josh. What's up? What's going on, guys? How are you guys today? Yeah, Very well. So good over here. Yeah, you must be happy with the Dorman result this week. Yeah, yeah, much needed, much needed result. I was saying basically the word catastrophic might have been dropped if we got anything but a win. 
honestly, considering coming off of one point in the past three games and the dreadful performance from Gladbach, we needed to bounce back. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, it's not been the best season for Dortmund, but you've got to hope that this is going to be like a catalyst now to move on to bigger and better things, really. I hope so. And we saw, I mean, we can obviously get into it a little bit, but we saw a little bit of change in shape, a couple of different key tactics I thought that Terzic did to really energize his Dortmund squad, and they went over and a little rough start, but all in all, it was a pretty comfortable win. Yeah, absolutely. So so let's go to Over the Bars Featured 4, which uh, there's no better place to start, obviously, this week with Josh's uh, team Dortmund with their 3-1 win over Augsburg. So let's go into a bit more detail on the game. So obviously it was a slow start, Josh, going behind inside the first 20 minutes. You must have been fearing the worst at that point, right? Yeah, my initial, res- <laughs> honestly, my initial thoughts were as soon as it was 10 minutes in the game and once again the goal, it wasn't even that we conceded so early, it was the way we conceded. A defensive lapse once again from Dortmund. Too much time in the box, and then Han put a, a beautiful finish past past hits, and it's just kind of like thrown back to the poor defensive effort against Gladbach. And I was like, "Oh, are we in for a long game or what?" Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and then, and then obviously it didn't get much better on 26 minutes with obviously Haaland missing the penalty as well. Uh, you must have been really fearing the worst. Was that a shock to you, Josh, about Haaland's miss because he's usually so prolific? Well, to be completely honest, if whoever was watching maybe the watch along, my uh, internet went out because uh, we have a house going up beside us, <laughs> and the internet went out for about three to four minutes. So when I, as soon as I came back on, the first thing I saw was the the ball going off the bar, and then I like the camera turned and it showed Holland's pen really missed. So I was like, so I just I obviously watched it back, and yeah, I mean, considering the troubles we've had from the spot, it would have been nice to have someone step up, put the ball in the back of the net comfortably, move on. He's our taker. But now, maybe it's Sancho next, maybe it goes back to Royce, maybe Holland continues, I don't know, we got to figure that out, but yeah, I mean, couldn't have gone any worse when I came back on the live stream and saw that. I think, um, yeah, I, as we've alluded to already, so Dortmund had a pretty slow start, 1-0 down, penalty miss, and the thing, it would have been understandable for any team, especially Dortmund, who had not had the greatest of seasons in general, to have gone very down on themselves or oh this just isn't our day and not effectively given in but thought you know this could lead to a loss in the end but credit to Dortmund I think they very much turned it on and were then very comfortable in the game deserved a 3-1 winners the leveler came from a nice free kick and a good flick on Sancho then beautiful pass to finish it into the net after being released by Guerrero and then Sancho effectively being the provider for Haaland to then set up that unfortunate own goal but obviously a lovely whipped in ball from Haaland so Josh I think you've got got to be happy with that response and that bit of character shown by Dortmund yeah I mean Marco Royce on his 200th Bruce Dortmund appearance whips in his 87th assist to be the all-time leading assist getter for Bruce Dortmund it was quite a way to get us back in the game and as soon as that happened it was a uh, it was a game changer. The The team obviously put a lot more pressure on Augsburg. They didn't really have too many looks for the remainder of the game. And over time, they broke them down and got those other two goals to obviously get us, like I said, a relatively comfortable 3-1 win. Yeah, absolutely. And I think obviously regarding the team news, you must have been, I mean, I've watched a little bit of your channel as well. I watch it quite often, your analysis after the games. And I know that you were calling for Berkey, perhaps that his form hadn't been good enough. Obviously, he was dropped for this game in favour of hits. Do you think that's going to be something that happens more permanently now that we're going to see hits in net? I I don't know. That's a that's a tough call. I mean, I had a feeling no matter what happened because there was rumours that he picked up a knock and that he has not a long term injury, but a, a big enough injury to keep him out of this game and the Paderborn game coming up. So you see it a lot of times with with different approaches to dropping players to maybe put a little bit more pressure not on the player. They like to say that there's injury. I'm not saying that, I honestly don't know, but I had a good feeling he was going to get dropped regardless, and then coincidence enough, he picks up a knock, but I, I think more than anything, it had to be a reaction for Berkey. I think the last couple games were just, for his standard, what we know he can play, a little unacceptable, so there's no better to get a reaction from a player than obviously drop him, and then maybe the coach felt it'd be a little easier to say that there was injury so it didn't look like he got sacked and dropped because of performance. I don't know. There's a lot to look into it, but... I mean, if Hits keeps it up, it, it makes it a little harder for Berkey to get back in. Yeah, and um, just as we were chatting before we went live, Josh, I think the thing you mentioned that you thought you saw a few other tweaks that uh, Terzic had maybe maybe brought in. Do you want to maybe elaborate on what, what you've seen? 
Yeah, absolutely. There was two main main things I wanted to talk about um, going into this Dortmund game, and they've been things I've been calling for for a few weeks. But the first thing was the formation. So Terzic is relatively comfortable, obviously playing in a four-two-three-one. It's a formation he sticks with for a while now, and it's because that's kind of the formation he got brought up doing. But there was another formation that you, you saw from his time at West Ham, even with the Thomas Tuchel area or era with the four-one-four-one. So I always thought that that would maybe be an interesting one to bring in, mainly because I thought as defensively vulnerable we can be, having Schultz at left back, maybe push Guerrero up to left mid, I thought it'd be a new look. He went a little differently, and it was genius, because in the last time we played Augsburg, we had 80% of the ball, and we lost 2 nothing. So we clearly didn't have a creative spark to break down a very stubborn defense. So what he did is he went to 4-1-4-1, but had Brandt and Royce playing off each other as the number 10s, and just basically gave us a front five of attack with, uh, with Guerrero on... On left back and it worked we, we created a lot more than that first game against Augsburg and ended up scoring three goals yeah absolutely I mean uh, a little bit more about Terzic like do you think he's going to be he has the, opp- the opportunity to kind of be long-term Dortmund manager or do you want to see someone like more high caliber brought in in summer I I mean I, I've been saying it a lot on the channel I said I don't have a specific person in mind who I think will take Dortmund to the next level looking at the realistic managers we could potentially get and looking at where we are, are right now at a club, there's no one that I've picked out being like, yes, you're the one. However, realistically, looking at our options, I think there's probably three. There's Terzic, which it'll depend what he does this season. And I don't think seeing what he's done so far, there, that makes me scream that, yes, he's a manager going forward. But there's a long, long season still to go. We'll see if he can get us the top four finish, a cup run, deep run in the Champions League. And if not, I think Marco Rose is clearly the heavy favorite being linked over. And then the outside shot of Jesse Marsh. Yeah. Interesting stuff. And um, we're referring to the kind of almost five-man attack that Dortmund were were playing with going forward. I think one player that did stand out um, was Jaden Sancho. He's he's looked quite refreshed, I I would say, in in recent weeks or maybe even months. to, To be fair, obviously, Josh would have been watching him more carefully. Um, of course, Sancho has been linked heavily with with my English team, Man United, over the last summer. Been not so much chat this January. Um, do you think that he just accepts that a move certainly won't happen in January, just to get his head down and start playing some good football again? Well, the I'll, I'll touch on two of those points. So the first one is like when I was talking about the tactics again and the kind of the resurgence here of Jane Sancho is I always said that he needed to be switched to the left hand side. I thought that he was so good last season on the right because of the overlapping runs of Hakimi and the link-up play. They're both intelligent players. Munier and Mirai doesn't really offer Sancho that, so a lot of the times this year I've seen him kind of getting lost and running out of a creative outlet. Switching him over to the left with another phenomenal fullback is is Guerrero, and you saw this game. Guerrero was bombing up the, down the pitch, which made it basically a six-man attack. The intricate passing between Sancho and Guerrero, which is something that I was just calling for, and it led to the winning goal. So. I thought that was a big thing with hopefully getting him a little bit more confident, being able to play with Guerrero and just making him more comfortable. But going on to your further question about him is I think that Jaden's a professional right now and he I don't know exactly what he wants. He's been very professional in that way of not saying I want to move, not pulling an Aubameyang, pulling a Dembele. He's just been kind of calm and cool and he has, his form hasn't been excellent this year, but he's been a professional nonetheless and I don't know what his future holds, but... I think no matter what, if he's here in Dortmund, he'll be playing his heart out. And if he does get that move, he'll go out with class. Real. And then one, one last question for me, particularly on Dortmund. Josh, whilst we've got you here, um, realistically moving forward towards the end of the season, obviously you've mentioned hope, hoping for a decent cup run. And then what, what are your ultimate realistic aims for the rest of the season? Is it just securing top four now? I mean, looking at the financial implications on the club, it would be horrible if we didn't get a top four finish. As much as I'd love to win the cup, go for a deep Champions League run, the most realistic and most important thing for us to do first is number one, get top four. That sets us up for next season comfortable. Whoever, Whatever manager comes in, they all have an ability to be able to build a team. If you miss out on Champions League football, you miss out on a lot of money. You, you could pay, potentially not even have the interest of getting a specific type of player, a specific type of manager, and it would put us in a big hole. So that's my number one target. After that, I'd love to go on a on a cup victory. I mean, I would go at anything for a DFBL Cup Pokal final and see what we can do there. Uh, I think we're one of the favorites with Leipzig, Leverkusen, um, 
and I just would ho obviously hope priority goes a little bit for that, and hopefully we can go for a run. And then, of course, the Champions League, I don't have cr crazy expectations for. I would like to see us go as far, far as we can, quarter semis, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. So let's move on to the, the second uh, featured game this week, which was indeed Bayern's comfortable home win over Hoffenheim. Like obviously reversing the 4-1 defeat in Hoffenheim on the second game of the season as well. So quite ironic there. So yeah, I mean, uh, obviously this was a, a pretty, uh, I think the first half was quite close, to be honest with you. Obviously, I think one of the keys was Ilhas Bebu's miss as well. But like, it was put on a plate for him. He just had to head in at nil-nil, I think after about 26 minutes. And obviously he put it wide, so... I mean, we, we've talked a lot on this show about Bayern having quite a bit of luck in recent weeks and that the performances haven't been quite as good as the results. And I think this was another situation. But then, obviously, once that uh, once that miss happened, I think it was a pretty comfortable win in the end, Rory, for uh, Bayern. Yeah, I think looking at the game itself, th those chances are key. Um, Baby not only did he have that chance with his head, he had one before it early on, before Bayern had even really started. Um in, in a close half of football, that's obviously key. Uh, and you, you look back on that. Um, and obviously, eventually, Bayern woke up. Uh, the Giants, you know, they came back and, and started to play some, some decent football, to be fair. And I think we have to give them credit for the way they played to score those four goals. Um, Kingsley Coman, again, looking very dangerous, providing assists. Um, left, right and centre, basically, is good form continues. Uh, Muller, I thought, was was very dangerous as well. Um, so, yeah, the, the beast keeps on going forward. Um, Josh, from what you've seen of Bayern so far this season, I mean, would you agree with me and Mark in the fact that they're, well, they're seven points clear at the moment and we, we don't think we've even seen them get out of third or fourth gear yet, really? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's totally fair. It's... Uh... It, it, it's almost like the other teams were just shooting themselves in the foot, making it so much easier on a Bayern team who, like you said, wasn't playing the best kind of football. But, I mean, when you got a striker like Robert Lewandowski, if you're not playing the best kind of football, you give him one chance, he'll put the ball in the back of the net. We saw it in the perfect example of that Leverkusen game. In a yeah. game which Leverkusen played pretty well, and that at the time they were top of the table. But one, one slip-up, you get, give that man an opportunity, it's in the back of the net. Plus, Kimmich coming back from injury is huge for that midfield. And you saw it with that hat trick of assists the guy got. He got assists again in the Hoffenheim game. So I think they're going to start picking it up and honestly cruise at this point. Yeah, I think l looking at Bayern as a side, certainly they're, they're in fact going forward. There's no there's no escaping that. And on days where they're not, they've got the world's best striker in Lewandowski to, to put in the back of the net. At the other end of the pitch... They certainly look vulnerable. I think Manuel Neuer has found some great form again, to be fair, which has probably saved them in a lot of games, actually, because that defence can certainly be got at. Hoffenheim could have well have easily have had more than one goal. So, Josh, hope for other teams. Bayern can certainly be leaky. And if teams can actually put in a full 90-minute performance against the champions, you'd imagine, or you could easily see them dropping more points the rest of the season. Yeah, I mean, if they're going to drop points, it's going to be because of the back, and especially at that right back position. I mean, we saw Sar there, who just wasn't good enough. They have young Richards there, who, I mean, I don't know if the confidence is quite there to be able to take that on week in, week out. And other than that, they have Pavard, who's got his own issues. I personally think he's a better center back than he would be a right back. So there's definitely keys to that that defense that other teams can unlock. But, I mean, if you don't take those chances and you, do, and you are able to get on goal, you still have that wall of Manuel Neuer, who's got incredible form this year, and... Like you said, I mean, there's been games this season where it's just like Bayern's defense has disappeared, but yet teams still can't score because because of him. So, I mean, looking at the table right now, I don't see any team catching Bayern. To to be, to be completely honest, if anyone is Leipzig, they're gonna have to go on a run of form on their own to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what about Hoffenheim, Josh? Because I mean, obviously, they have been a side that we've been used to seeing in the top half for the last three or four years. I think, like the way I see it, is that the season's been a little bit underwhelming for them, really. I mean, obviously, they have had a few good results. Obviously, the reverse fixture against Bayern, they won four-one. Obviously, a few other games. Uh, the I think they won the last two games three-nil before this one. But I think obviously, twenty-two points from nineteen games. Do you think that's good enough for Hoffenheim, really, Josh? No, I mean, I mean they. The, they have a new manager who came in. Obviously, he had a lot of success in Bayern Munich's second second team, but this is a big jump from the third division up to the Bundesliga, and he's 
finding some of the formations, some of the tactics he used down in that, that league aren't really coping with this league. And a t- team that's got a lot of talent should be doing a lot better than where they are. They should be a Europa League team, in, in my opinion. So, I mean, they're giving him some time, which is sometimes nice to see in this day and age because he could have, in my opinion, for the team and, and the amount of money that they can put in this club, he's lucky to still have a job right now. Yeah, I would totally agree, to be honest. I think, obviously, I think the two wins before this game had saved him, but we'll have to see how they bounce back. Obviously, they've got Frankfurt next, who are probably the most on-form side in the division. So, I mean, if they lose that, then all of a sudden they're back in trouble again. And I think probably Hernes will be back under some pressure. So, we'll have to see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to the third feature game this week, which was indeed a it was a bottom kind of three or four battle between Cologne and Bielefeld, which ended in a comprehensive win for the home team Cologne. So yeah, I mean obviously I think the key to this was Marias Wolf's uh, two goals in the first what 20 25 minutes, which kind of really uh, put the the home side on a on a good trajectory in this game. Rory, what did you make of that one? Yeah, I mean, it was certainly crucial that that Cologne went out and attacked the game, I think. Um, we, we've seen with Armenia this season that they're very good on sitting on sitting on a game and keeping it close, frustrating teams, and then maybe getting, getting that, you know, that goal, which obviously they still got in this game. Um, so, it, you know, it's one of those where if you get two goals against Bielefeld early on, you can effectively say it's game, set and match. Um, but they'll never, they, obviously we've not really seen them get thrown, you know, five and six past them apart from maybe Frankfurt a few weeks ago. So, yeah, crucial from Marias Wolf, who, who, you know, got himself a double, being in the right place at the right time from a couple of set pieces and such. So crucial that they got into it and then they cruised it from there. Um, obviously that result really ties up that bottom well, the relegation playoff play, shall we say. The result is catastrophic, really, for Nimes and Schalke. Um, but we'll talk about those two teams perhaps a little bit later on. But now we've got Hertha, Armenia and, and Cologne now fighting it out for that relegation place, or to avoid it, rather. Um, so a point in it at the moment. Um, Josh, from what you've seen from the three teams that I've mentioned so far, so Hertha, Cologne and Armenia... Can you say which one's maybe going to finish in that relegation spot? Well, I definitely think Cologne uh, did a lot today to prove that it's not going to be them. I think that, I mean, the old Dortmund, Dortmund Loney, uh, Wolf had a, had a big game, got a couple goals, but it also comes from ambition. And something that I liked about this Cologne side is basically their management went out and got a couple signings. They got Emmanuel Dennis, who is obviously a relatively quick and agile striker to come in, as well as the free agent signing of Max Meyer, which... I mean, if it's a, couple, mm-hmm. a team who is under pressure and gets a couple more bodies in there, it makes everyone just kind of put that little extra shift in because you know your starting spot is now up for debate with these two new signings. And look at the reaction after these these signings. A pretty comfortable victory for Cologne players like Marius Wolf, who obviously stepped it up in a game like this. And I don't see Cologne really slipping up too much more. And I'd probably put that final, final relegation playoff to uh, Armenia. Yeah, and, and what about, obviously, uh, the, the next team that we'll discuss in a little bit more detail is obviously uh, the Frankfurt's three what win. So I think that brings us nicely on to talk a bit more about Hertha Berlin. So, I mean, obviously, for me, these have been the most underperforming side in the whole division, and I would include Schalke in that as well. Because, I mean, this is a side that, if you look at it on paper, it's got a lot of household names. But, I mean, if you look at the front, you've got Piotek, you've got Gwendozi, you've got Cunha, You've got a lot of uh, Luca Bacchio as well, especially in the kind of midfield and forward positions. They're a very attacking side as well. They always go with that front three. And I just I don't know why they're not getting results because they've shown signs in in certain games, but the majority of the season has just been so underwhelming. And for me, just not good enough, Josh, really, from them. No, it's un- unbelievable. I was, when I was doing a lot of Bundesliga predictions at the beginning of the season, I think I put Hertha in my personal prediction like eighth, just because I knew there was a little inconsistency there, but I had a lot of people putting them in, I see putting them in Champions League positions, and a lot because like they spent a lot of money. They brought in a lot of bodies, a lot of good players, like you've mentioned. They have a they had a solid manager who obviously just couldn't put the pieces together. And yeah, I mean, like you said, we knew Schalke was going to be poor, but this is an absolute shock. Shock! This is an absolute shock <laughs> that they yeah. are performing the way that they are, and. I mean, unless they pick it up, and I, there could be a chance that they fall in that final relegation spot instead of Armenia. Yeah, it's heading uh, well in the very much in the wrong direction from a Hertha Berlin point of view. 
on the other side of the fence and look, looking at Frankfurt, me and Mark have been really impressed by them in the last few weeks or, well, stretching that out months, really. Um, one of the form teams in the Bundesliga and now find themselves nestled quite nicely into the top four as things stand. Um, have you been impressed by them, Josh? Obviously, they look incredibly dangerous going forward with a, you know, a rich of attacking talent. If you can leave... Luka Jovic on the bench and just make him do the odd cameo, then you've got to be doing something right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you said about underachieving teams and the, probably the number one that pops up is Hertha, but overachieving teams, man, the first one that comes to mind is Frankfurt because they've got a system that works for them. they got a commanding goalie at the back with Trap, solid defense, which a lot of their play comes from their wing backs, which I really like Kostic. But for me, a player that I've followed for a long time now since his days over at Porto where he scored 16 goals as I think a 20-year-old, got a lot of notice, got that big move to Milan, did not work out whatsoever. But I knew that there was a baller in there and it just he had to find the right time, get the, get the faith that he needed. And he's got, I think, 16 goals this season. He's mm-hmm. absolutely firing, keeping Luka Jovic on the bench plus Unes and, and Kamada under him. So, I mean, they're a fun team to watch and, and I'm, I'm happy to see them. Got to see them play live too, so, you know, a little soft spot for them as well. So I hope they stay out of Dortmund's way, but have a relatively <laughs> comfortable uh, finish to, for their season. Yeah, and I think on top of that as well, I mean, the character that they show as well, I mean, they completely dominated the first half. They should have been probably two or three in up. I think the the Hertha goalkeeper was keeping the, the club in it, really. And then obviously, I think from the first real attack, probably the only attack of the whole game, really, for Hertha Berlin, Obviously, they managed to go ahead. So you're thinking it might just be one of those days for Frankfurt and uh, they might get the smash and grab. And I think that was after about 60 or 62 minutes. So like, it was quite late on in the game. And then obviously to win so comfortably and to show the character, Rory, uh, to get that result. I mean, it's really impressive, to be honest. Yeah, it's really encouraging, I think, you have to say, from a Frankfurt point of view. Um, we've seen them draw a lot of games as well earlier on this season. So... Going behind after an hour, not a lot of clubs have often got the bottle or the confidence to come back, but equaliser instantly, bang, bang, late, late few goals, and then it, obviously on paper it looks comfortable, doesn't it, 3-1. But yeah, fair play to Frankfurt. They're looking like one of the, one of the teams to beat. Um, well, we've seen patchy form from everyone really inside that little bracket of from second down to even ninth going down as far as Freiburg, I think you can say. So if you can keep a level of consistency in, in this league, other teams are gonna, you know, are gonna drop drop out. So right now, Frankfurt, you've got to say are almost favourites to to come third at this rate. So I don't know if you agree with that that one, Josh, but they look comfortable at the moment. Yeah, I, well, I mean, if on paper and on results and the way that this team's gelling on top of the addition of Luke Lukijovic, there's nothing wrong with saying that they should be favorites to get that third, but, I mean, it, it depends. If some of the, the sleeping giants wake up, I, I just feel like Dor- Dortmund and even a couple other ones have a little bit more quality on the team to be able to, to go over a consistent period of time and take that. But if they don't and they keep shooting themselves in the foot in the way that Frankfurt's playing, yeah, there's absolutely no reason why Frankfurt can't get a Champions League position, but... I think Jovic is going to fire that team up once they get him back in the starting 11 and they're just going to keep sailing. Yeah, absolutely. So so that concludes our kind of uh, featured four this week. So I just wanted to start the rest of the roundup with the, the last game on Sunday, which was another team currently in the third place, Wolfsburg, actually, at the moment, who got a really, really impressive win, a very easy 3-0 win over, well, I wouldn't say high-flying, but on form. Freiburg is probably a good way of describing it. Now, the way I see uh, Wolfsburg, the, the style of football is a lot more kind of turgid. Maybe turgid isn't the right word, but it's a lot more pragmatic than Frankfurt, who really kind of use the wing backs and kind of stretch the play a lot. They play on the front foot. I think Wolfsburg is a lot kind of, it's based on strong defence. It's based on being hard to break down. I mean, we saw last week with their win in Leverkusen, and that was a really, really kind of hard-fought win. Obviously, today, though, we did see them attack a lot, and we saw them get a comfortable win. Uh, uh, Josh, what did you make of that one? Well, like you said, I mean, Freiburg is a tough team to break down. I mean, Schmid is, in my opinion, is one of the better wing-backs in the league. They sit back, they can defend well, and they can hit on the break when they need to. And Wolfsburg was patient. They knew what they had to do. They had a game plan, like you said, started on, on good defense. Plus, they also have a very good goal scorer. So, you know, when you get him in opportunities, Vegas will put that ball in the back of the net. John Brooks got in there on the goal scoring as well. And a 
comfortable win over Leverkusen, followed by a comfortable win after a decent Freiburg side. Yeah, this Wolfsburg team is something to keep an eye on. Yeah, absolutely. And do you think they can get a top four berth as well? Or do you think, similar to Frankfurt, they might fade away over the final stretch? It's it's so hard because you think of teams that should fade away. It's Frankfurt, it's Wolfsburg. Neither one on paper really should go for a top four finish. However, they're playing better than the other big boys. Like, like I'm a, obviously a big Dortmund fan, but I mean, my wish we were playing on the form that Frankfurt or Wolfsburg are right now. They got their stuff together. They, they know what they're going to do at each and every game. And there's no reason why they shouldn't believe that they can get in a top four finish. Whether they will, we'll find out if, like I said, if the Sleeping Giants wake up, it'll put a little bit more pressure. But if they don't, there's, yeah, I mean, that top four could easily have both of them in it. I think what, what one thing that both Frankfurt and Wolfsburg got for them is that at both ends, so it, obviously the key positions, I'm saying goalkeeper and striker make huge differences. I think in both teams, Wolfsburg, so in Castiles and Trap. And then Silver and Veghorst. Yeah. Goals at both ends. And then Castiles still had to make a few good saves today. Freiburg were far, you know, they weren't a bad, you know, didn't throw in a bad performance. They were decent. I think it's just the level that Wolfsburg are at, at the moment that saw them through. So that that's obviously a big thing. And, and sometimes when you just got that settled unit at a few key positions, it can sometimes be the difference. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and I, th I think also both of those sides have got bottle as well, which is something we've not seen perhaps from Leverkusen, who've been pretty poor of late. And I mean, they've been dominating some games, specifically last week when they played against Wolfsburg, and they just can't get over the line. And it just seems as though they've just let the heads drop. And I don't see that happening with uh, Frankfurt and Wolfsburg. I think they've got the mentality. They've got good managers, obviously, with Adi Hütter at uh, Frankfurt, he's another one that's really starting to build a kind of reputation really in the German game now. So we'll have to see where the season takes. And, yeah. Okay, so moving on to the Friday night game, obviously I think Rory was getting a little bit worried about his uh, one of his favourite teams in the Bundesliga, Stuttgart. They had gone three games straight defeats, but obviously bouncing back with a comfortable 2-0 win over struggling minds, Rory. Did, did you enjoy that performance from your team? Uh, well, I think it was just one of those games where it was the first half um, that took took a you know a real fan to watch. What uh, wasn't a, a great contest. Um, Mines were you know in in the game, and then just a bit bit of quality is the difference. Um, Souza is a real player to watch. I think he's a really good left back. Has a fantastic cross on him as well, and it, he was the provider for the first goal. Um, which is a nice header at the end by Kladzic. And then second goal is a really nice solo goal from Silas, picking the ball up ineffectively just outside of his penalty area to run the length of the pitch um, to then to hammer home. So that, that was just a really nice goal. It's a good, solid performance from Stuttgart. I think that, you know, there might have been the odds worry, like, like you said, for the management, perhaps if they were getting dragged into the, well, the relegation playoff place battle. Um, but I think that that will see them see them over the line. Um, fr from a mind point of view, they obviously they seem to turn up against the big teams. Obviously, we've seen them get a credible creditable draw against Dortmund, and then shocking RB uh, three two just the other week. It's amazing. Um, Josh, from from a mind point of view, obviously things aren't looking great from their point of view. Uh, have you got any thoughts on? On this, do you think they've got any chance of getting out there? Obviously, we've seen them get rid of Mateta as well. Uh, is that them throwing in the towel? I mean, like I said, you're talking about ambitions, and I mentioned the two signings from Cologne. Like, that's that's what you want to do. You want to show the squad, squad that, look, we got good players coming in as well. we got positions that are up for grabs. If you guys want to want to play, put it in, get in the starting 11, get, get points. Selling your star, star striker isn't the number one way to get get chemistry and get the team firing so i mean no i i don't think there's much much of debate right here i think there's two heavy favorites to go down it even though they got that credible draw against a very poor dortmund side that night i still think Mainz and schalke are going to find themselves in the second division next year yeah, I totally agree with you on the ambition. I think I said the same to Rory when they saw Mateta. I mean, it's just like, I mean, th this Mainz team, they've been in the Bundesliga for 11 seasons straight. A lot of people forget that. A lot of people see Mainz as like minnows, really. And in many ways, they are. But they're an established Bundesliga side. And I think if I was a fan of Mainz now, I'd be really, really 
angry, to be honest with you, because I think um, it's not good enough to sell your best player and then not really bring in, in anyone to replace them. It's almost like just saying, OK, we accept relegation and it's yeah. like, you know, I mean, for a side like Mainz as well, the other problem is w with the pandemic, the never ending pandemic, especially in Germany, you know, it's like there's no guarantee fans are going to get in the stadium anytime soon. So they're going to be financially, they're going to be in big trouble as well. So it's like, um, yeah, I mean, there's no guarantee they're going to get out of the second Bundesliga next year by any means if, if they do go down, obviously. So, yeah, th this little fairy tale for mine started by Jurgen Klopp and then carried on by Tuchel, obviously, could be coming to an end now, obviously, in 2021, but we'll have to see. Yeah. So, yeah, so let's continue. Obviously, the, the game of the weekend this weekend was a bit of a letdown, really. I mean, everybody hoped that Leipzig v. Leverkusen. I think me and Rory build it as the game of the... Um, the underperforming sides. I think we expected probably more than one goal in that game. But I wouldn't say the game was bad, but it was like obviously a lot of missed chances in there, specifically from Leipzig. Uh, Rory, what did you make of that one? Yeah, I, I think you, you put it quite correctly there. I think it was a tight game, but Leipzig had most of the chances. Um, I think, what again, I, I've mentioned a real big fan of Danny Olmo. So, so many classy touches in there um, in, in that game it was was effectively the difference maker. I know and Cuckoo mate obviously got himself the goal from a very bit of odd defending. I thought the, the, the first shot is kind of blocked and then there's about three or four defenders around him who just let him tear up for himself and he volleys home. So um, yeah, that, that wasn't particularly impressive. And I think we've seen that from Leverkusen just since that Bayern Munich game, their defence has gone absolutely crazy. Um, Josh, have you have you seen? I mean, we've seen some inconsistent performances from both teams, but Leverkusen at the back looks shot confidence. Yeah, and I mean, I'm glad you brought that point up. I, I was going to literally just about to mention it, but I think that Leverkusen was high and flying until that crushing result against Bayern. I think that they really thought they would have been top of the, top of the league at Christmas at the break. And unfortunately, like I said, you gave Lewandowski a, a chance off a very poor goal to, to concede. And I think they just haven't been, made a little bounce back. It hasn't been the same side. But when I looked at the team sheets coming out, I immediately thought to myself, this is a comfortable win for, for Leipzig. I don't understand the tactics of, of Peter Bosch not starting Schick or Alario, putting Bailey in a position he doesn't play, he wasn't comfortable there, didn't look very effective. Yeah, there's big boys at the back for, for Leipzig. Monster, monster men. Like They're tough. You need an Alari. You need a Patrick Schick in there. I thought that just was a clear-cut op option, and they didn't go with that. And honestly, they got bossed, and I thought, boring-ish game, but a relatively comfortable win for, for Leipzig. Yeah, I think it's a good point about Bosch as well, because, I mean, obviously, the former Dortmund coach, he started off really, really well there, but he seems to be a manager for when things are going well, for what I can see. So, like, when you get him wins, he's great. Like, his style's very good. Like, his, uh, his teams are very fast. They play on the front foot. But I think, like, when things are going badly, it goes very bad sometimes. And I think he will be starting to see deja vu a little bit from his time at Dortmund at the minute. I mean, I think it's now it's five defeats in seven for them now. I mean, it's just a shocking run, really. I think the only game they've won in those seven was against your boys, uh, so yeah. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I mean, it's been a really poor run. They've lost, I mean, they have had some difficult fixtures, to be fair. I mean, they played Union away, which they lost. They lost at home to Wolfsburg. Obviously, that game against Bayern. They lost to Frankfurt and now today as well. So, yeah, five defeats in seven. It's just one win in seven. It's just not good enough, really, for a side of that quality, uh, John. Yep. No, I, I, I totally agree. And, I mean, I saw Peter Bosch at his absolute best for the first seven games of Dortmund, followed by his absolute worst. So, <laughs> it is showing a bit of telltale. I think Leverkusen have a little more patience with him because... He has found some fun talent in Alario and obviously just getting like Diaby and Bailey firing. So I don't I don't think his job's quite under as much pressure as some people would think. I think he does have the quality to turn this thing around. I just think they need to get over that Bayern defeat that happened weeks and weeks and weeks ago because yeah. that was the indicator of when they I think they realized well we're not going to be in it for the title and they thought maybe they could coast and they got a rude awakening. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So so let's just finish with two one-all draws as well. So let's start with uh, the Werder Bremen v Schalke game. I mean, obviously, I think in this game, it was a relatively even match. But I think probably the big talking point, it looked as though Werder Bremen had won it right at the end. 
my prediction was 2 1 to Verda, so I was celebrating that one as well. But obviously, I mean, it was quite a clear offside, really, when it, when it came in. But Rory, do you, who, who would you say deserved to win that, if anyone? Or would you say a draw was a fair result? Really? Um, well, in terms of the performance, Schalke started aggressively. Um, they looked like the team who wanted to win um, and deserve, deservedly led, I, I think it's fair to say. Um, but Verda, they do have quality in areas uh, and they did manage to come back into it in the second half. I think a draw is probably about right. The result is 10 times better for Verda than it is Schalke. I mean, <laughs> draws and points aren't getting you anywhere right now, unfortunately, in, in, in the shape of where the, of what, of what the table kind of suggests. Of course, the, the result for, for Cologne this weekend is, again, it's terrible for both Mines and Schalke. Um, so, yeah, poor game for, for two teams that are, are obviously not not enjoying themselves this season. Um, I, yeah, so I can't really say much much more on Schalke. Obviously, for them, it might have been a nice to have seen Huntervar start. Um, but, I mean, other than that, unless Huntervar can bag goals and goals and goals, I think, I think we're looking at the end of Schalke in the Bundesliga. Josh, any thoughts on, on obviously the the blue side uh, of the rivalry? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this was a game like you said. A draw was probably fitting the way that it was it was being played. But I mean, you can't go for a draw anymore. Like you're running out of opportunities. This was a team for the taking. It, it was a team where you had had the lead. You could have seen out three points. You could have done things a little bit differently. It didn't turn out the way that. Schalke wanted to, and, and a draw is, like you said, just not good enough. It's not getting you absolutely anywhere. You're sitting dead last in the Bundesliga, and you knew that the game was there for the taking, which not a lot of games will be, considering the way that your form has been. And when you give up an opportunity to take three points, it honestly, it just it kicks you down a little further. Yeah, yeah. I think this game was one of the ones that they really kind of had to win, because if you look at the next few games, they've got Leipzig next week. I mean, I mean, I know Leipzig lost to Mainz, but you'd still heavily fancy them in that game. Then, obviously, they've got a derby, Josh, against uh, your boys in, I think, three weeks. So, yeah, I mean, it's the fixture list isn't really looking good for them. And, I mean, realistically, you need... But I think me and Rory, we said at the halfway stage of the season, you need to find probably seven, eight wins in the second half to stay up. And so far, they've won none of the first two of the second half. So, I mean, the nine points are drifted, even the relegation uh, place now. So, the relegation playoff place, sorry. So, yeah, they need to pick up three wins, plus the, the goal difference is minus 34. So, they effectively need to pick up 10 yeah. points on third from bottom to even get into the relegation place. So it's just relegation playoff, place, I should say. So it's really not looking good for them at all, is it? I think it's curtains, as they would say. <laughs> yeah, and like you said, with yeah. Mainz, I, I don't see them being a team that's already he heavy favourites to come back up next season. I think if they go, go down, which it's looking like they will, I think they'll be in the second division for a few seasons. Yeah, I mean, we've seen it with Hamburg as well, of course. Hamburg is a massive club in Germany. I think this year the table's looking a bit better for them in the second division. But yeah. obviously they've had two misses. They didn't even make the playoff place in the first two years. So it's no uh, given. I mean, my team, Nuremberg, as well. I mean, they're right near the bottom of the second division now. But yeah, I mean, this is another big club in the Bundesliga as well. With probably one of the bigger budgets in the second league. But I mean, it's not easy. It's a very, very competitive league, that second tier. And I mean, there's nothing between top and bottom, really. The teams are so even at that level. So, yeah, I totally agree. There's no guarantee that Schalke are all mine to come up next year as well. So, yeah, let, let's just close with the, obviously, Union 1, Gladbach 1. This is a battle between the teams in 7th and 8th. So, it's like the upper mid-table battle, really, I guess. It's um, Yeah, I think, for me, Gladbach really dominated this game. They probably should have managed to get the win, really. I mean, a few, they could have had a penalty at the end as well. Perhaps a little bit harsh not to get that decision. But, I mean, yeah, Union, they're so dangerous for set plays. And they got that goal from a classic, uh, long whip ball in from the free kick and then the header. They get so many goals from that. Uh, Union. So, Rory, who do you think would be happier with the point there? Uh, definitely Union. Um, they're, they're good. Well, obviously another team that must be overachieving. Season continues. Direct from set, play, uh, set pieces. I mean, it was a bit... I mean, it, was, it seemed like the ball was going towards goal forever from the header. It seemed to be really soft, but it was really well directed. So, obviously, another excellent way to, to get yourselves ahead. And Gladbach did eventually come for them. Plie with a really nice finish, actually. Like, a really nicely curled, whipped finish. Uh, important for Gladbach that he 
does uh, show his Champions League form in the Bundesliga a bit more. Um, having Turan back, obviously, they're probably just starting to get themselves going a bit more. But it, for, for Gladbach, it's just a case of too many draws. Um, they're starting to drop down again. They're, they're in the mix, of course. But yeah, draws aren't going to get you a top four right now. Yeah, and Josh, do you think Gladbach have got enough quality to get that top four place, or do you think they're going to be focusing on the Champions League more? I, I mean, like I said, even with with Dortmund, I mean, like the the money of the Champions League is is phenomenal. I think Gladbach will take a hard look at themselves and realize, like, hey, are we favorites to win the Champions League, or do we need the money to get back when we from getting a Champions League position? Which there's no reason again why any of those teams that are just circling the top four can't get in. Like I said, there's a good shot Frankfurt, Wolfsburg. Gladbach, Leverkusen, Dortmund, all of them have a good shot of getting in. All of them are going to want it because of just the revenue in, in a COVID-stricken season. You need it to be able to get signings, to get the kind of people you want going forward. So, I mean, it was a kind of a disappointing result for, for Gladbach. As a Dortmund fan, it was a beautiful result for us. We were able to leapfrog both of them. And, yeah, I mean, I think they'll be bummed out, but I do think they have a shot of getting the top four. Excellent stuff. Well, I think that brings a close to our to our review of the, the Match Day 19 um, weekend in the Bundesliga. Just before we close up and let Josh go as well, we'll just quickly go through our hero and zero of the weekend, uh, which obviously myself and Mark have chosen. Josh, uh, before we go through what we've chosen, anyone anyone can spring to mind, hero and zero? In your mind? So when, when you do zero or hero, are you talking about a specific player or a specific team? Well, well, you can do a team if you want. Players. We do players usually, but we can have a team. Um, so for hero, I'm going to go with probably Andre Silva, just because mm. I thought the performance he put in was incredible. I love I love him as a, as a player, and I think he just keep keeps showing up a very, very successful um, successful season he's having. And I'll, maybe I'll do the first team. I'm going to put the zero as, as Schalke for the reasons that we, we touched on. I'm going to come on here and drop <laughs> you're that. You're enjoying but... that one, Josh. I can see that you're enjoying it. <laughs> you have to, though. Like we said, <laughs> the, you just, Mark, you alluded to the schedule coming up for them. I mean, this is a this is a huge opportunity in a game that they were definitely had the chance of winning. And to not pick up three points is just really sinking their, sinking their season. And going forward, you don't know where the points are going to come from. So this was a big loss for them. Well, big yeah. draw, but lost yeah. points for them. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, it's a very good shout, um, to be fair, yeah, and it, as you mentioned, with, with the calendar coming forward for them. Um, so going on to the hero that we've chosen, um, it, it is indeed, well, we nominated Silver, but we actually ended up going for Marius Wolf uh, for his impact uh, in the six-pointer uh, of the relegation playoff place. So honourable mention to Andre Silver, who was very, very good as always with Marius Wolf. Well done, sir on getting two goals uh, for your side in the win. Uh, moving on to the zero, we didn't pick uh, a team ourselves, uh, myself and Mark. Um, it was a tricky one to go for in terms of players, I think, this season. No one had a particular stinker, uh, but we've, we've ended up going for uh, Elas Bebu for his uh, lack of clinicality in front of goal uh, for, for his side Hoffenheim, which could well have been the difference in maybe a closer game. Uh, so, unlucky last, there's always next week. Um, so, just as we're finishing up then for this week, um, our thanks very much to Josh for, for letting us have him back on the show. Um, Josh is running a superb channel on YouTube, JJD TV. Um, if you've not heard of it or you've not seen it, please do go on YouTube and check it out and get yourself subscribed. Um, and of course, you can find Josh on Twitter as well. He keeps everyone up to date on all the various shows he's doing, especially um, appearing on Dortmund's official Twitch channel, which is an incredible achievement. So well done, Josh. Keep up the good work. And thanks very much for coming on. Yeah, I appreciate it, my friends. And Mark was yeah, going to say yeah. something, I cut him off. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So just before we finish, I just want to remind you guys to check out our Twitter as well. Of course, this is like a really big feed on Twitter at Over the Bar FB. So, yeah, you can check that and kind of uh, follow that as well. We, we kind of uh, we have everything related to football. Remember that our original goal is actually a written article as well. So the biggest part of the Over the Bar blog is written journalism. So, yeah, check out all of our written articles. We've got stuff on just about everything, like um, 
League One as well. Remember to check out the League One show. Dave will kill me if I don't mention that. <laughs> so, yeah, remember that. So check that out. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well because we need to start – our goal is to start converting our followers on a, on Twitter onto our YouTube channel because that is important. Obviously, I'm sure Josh should uh, agree there that you need to kind of get those subs on your YouTube. So, yeah, remember to check that out as well. And yeah, obviously our website as well. We do have uh, the www.otbfootball.net. So you can see just about everything. You can see our little space for the Bundesliga show. You can see the space for the League One show. And you can see just about everything advertised as well. You can also find a little bit more information about the writers as well. So that's pretty much everything. So thanks again for joining us, Josh. It was a pleasure to have you on today and to hear your analysis of the games. Yeah, I'm glad that Dortmund won for you as well. <laughs> Well, I mean, Rory are rocking our jerseys. But yeah, guys, we really appreciate you guys having me back on. It was a lot of fun. I like shooting these episodes with you guys. And, and yeah, for you guys who were listening, definitely uh, subscribe to my channel, but definitely also subscribe to Over the Bar because the subscribers are definitely very important and they put us some awesome content and are some very good guys that I like doing shows with. Top yeah. man. Yeah, thanks a lot. So, yeah, so I think that's about everything. So, see you next week, guys. Auf Wiedersehen. Cheers, guys.